September 29th, 2017. Elon Musk releases a promotional video on YouTube through SpaceX that every news organization in the world jumped on. Eager to be first rather than be credible, the internet's science editors immediately slapped together articles on their clickbait websites that ran Musk's comments verbatim, never questioning the content they were regurgitating on his behalf. By October 3rd, YouTubers such as Thunderfoot had already taken his concept as described and tore it down. He took the very limited information provided by the video and broke down the launch site requirements for being remote, challenged the promised flight times since the times given seemed to be based on the delivery of nuclear weapons, and he tore apart the promised ticket price as being less than an economy fare. He also reminded us that the idea is nothing new and that NASA itself had canceled similar plans 24 years prior to develop something very much like this. Now, since Thunderfoot already covered all of that three years ago, our presentation is going to dive deeper into other, more recent claims instead, starting with Gwen Shotwell's TED Talk appearance in 2018. After the September 2017 release, there was hardly any articles on the topic until February 2018 when Gwen Shotwell embarrassed herself on behalf of Elon Musk at her TED Talk about the newly renamed BFR and what she called its residual capabilities. In front of a live audience, the host Chris Anderson replayed Musk's 2017 video clip of his Earth to Earth concept as Shotwell grinned from ear to ear. Our favorite part of this video comes after the video is shown when the host tried to talk Shotwell down from the ledge, but instead she doubled down. This, this, this is awesome, but it's crazy, right? Like this is never going to actually happen. Oh no, it's definitely going to happen. This is definitely going to happen. No, Gwen, this isn't going to happen. And we're going to demonstrate why using your video, combined with Musk's newest information releases of mid-June 2020 and November of 2019. Musk's present intentions are to develop floating spaceports for Starship, as he announced June 16, 2020, on Twitter. He is currently shopping for deep-sea oil rigs to refurbish into launch pads, which he intends to park off the coast of Texas for his own purpose. Now, if Musk is planning on using refurbished oil platforms, we're guessing he is unaware how floaty things work, because oil platforms in water deeper than 300 meters are typically free-floating and attached to the bottom by only cables making them subject to tidal, current, and wave actions. Some of the cities mentioned in the video have water depths in excess of 1,000 meters, so they won't be towers that reach all the way to the ocean floor. Musk's own statement is that these floating launch pads will need to be positioned 20 miles or 32 kilometers offshore due to the amount of noise these rockets are bound to create. Apparently, he is oblivious to the fact that sound travels very well across the top of a body of water and even seems amplified when traveling over calm water. We'll cycle back to that in just a minute, but first we need to find out what type of noise we're dealing with here. Since the Starship is still very much on the drawing board, it's not possible to cite what the decibel reading for such a launch actually would be, but we can state accurately that the space shuttle was 7.8 million pounds of thrust or 34.7 meganewtons caused sound pressure levels measuring 180 decibels when using the sound suppression systems and 211 decibels without them. Also, the Saturn V, the largest operational rocket to date, with 7.6 million pounds of thrust, or 34.5 meganewtons, caused a reported noise level of 204 decibels. In comparison, the Starship is promising to more than double those thrust numbers at 16 million pounds of thrust, or 72 meganewtons, so the question is, what does a doubling down of those forces do to the sound pressure levels? To give you an idea about noise, or sound pressure level measurements, 70 decibels is the lower limit of what people find to be irritating amounts of noise. A vacuum cleaner, or an active freeway, would be at the top of this range. Decibels are measured in relation to 70 decibels in a logarithmic scale, not unlike the pH scale measuring from the benchmark of 7 as neutral. On the SPL chart, 60 is half as loud as 70, and 50 is a quarter as loud as 70. The other way, 80 is twice as loud, and 90 is four times the sound pressure. So if the Starship system breaks the 210 decibel limit, it will be creating noise 16,384 times louder than the benchmark of 70 decibels. If it breaks the 220 decibel marker, it will be 32,768 times as loud. 
Sound at sea level diminishes by 6 decibels every time the distance between the source and the listener is doubled. This is called the inverse square law of sound propagation. Measurements of 100 decibels at 1 meter from the source drop to 94 decibels at 2 meters, 4 meters away it drops to 88, and at 8 meters it drops to 82. If the launch of a starship could force sound pressure levels into the range of 220 decibels, using this chart, the sound of a launch at the shoreline 32 kilometers away would still be an ear-splitting 130 decibels that could cause permanent hearing loss. This level is equivalent to standing one meter away from a fully throttled jet engine or having a shotgun going off constantly right next to your ear. In order to reach the benchmark of 70 decibels, the distance between the source and the listener would have to be 33,554 kilometers away. And since the circumference of the Earth is about 40,000 kilometers, that degree of separation is not possible. And yes, it is possible for sound to circumnavigate the globe. The sound created by the Krakatoa volcano eruption, for example, circled the Earth five times, once every 34 hours, before the sound completely subsided. Now, it bears mentioning that the theoretical upper limit for sound is 194 decibels, because above this threshold, sound is no longer moving through the air, but it is pushing it out of the way, creating a shockwave. And since sound travels extremely well over water, it's possible that no amount of separation between the shore and the launch pad will insulate cities ashore from these noise and shockwave effects. At minimum, at 194 decibels, there would need to be 2100 kilometers of separation between the source and the listener to achieve the 70 decibel discomfort benchmark. In a marine environment, noise travels further and five times faster than through air and SPLs can reach much higher than 194 decibels. 270 decibels, or over 2 million times greater than the acceptable volume of sound, has been replicated in a lab. All marine mammals will be affected by these levels of launch noise. Whales, orcas, dolphins, porpoises, actually every animal on this chart of cetaceans will be at risk. And so will seals, sea lions, and every other pinniped on this chart. The manatees that recently came off the endangered list in the U.S. that live in the Gulf of Mexico have incredibly finely tuned hearing, which is easily overwhelmed by background noise, as happens with the rest of their family of serenians. Extreme pressure levels will destroy their ability to hear and can wind up killing the animal, as it does with all manners of whales. Navy sonar, measuring between 140 and 170 decibels, is capable of killing whales, so to have an underwater sonic pressure wave measuring hundreds of times louder than this will be absolutely devastating, leading to die-offs and mass strandings. And it won't just be the sea mammals. These extreme sonic conditions will also kill off fish, decimate zooplankton populations, and the generated shock waves could shatter coral reefs. But hey, you needed to get to Shanghai in 30 minutes or less, right? Well, newsflash, it's definitely not going to be a 30-minute trip regardless not even close. Time to put Musk's claims of trips only taking between 30 and 60 minutes under the microscope, and we're going to compare these trips as he does against the prospect of a trip on an airline between two points. In fact, we will use the very trip advertised in his animation, from New York to Shanghai, China. As seen here, this is a trip that can be purchased online as a non-stop flight taking around 15 hours. The SpaceX animation shows people loading up on a ferry, leaving the island of Manhattan at 6.30 a.m. for a 7 a.m. departure. In fact, the animation shows the boat leaving from the Trade Center ferry terminal right by One World Trade on Manhattan. At the end of the trip, when it lands in Shanghai, it's 7.39 p.m. The next day, of course, since they would have crossed the international dateline. The ferry is shown arriving at a launch platform within view of the New York skyline but Musk said they needed 20 miles, or 32 kilometers, from shore to suppress the noise involved with the launch. The closest point to the ferry launch, which is 32 kilometers from land, is heading out to sea, and well over the horizon from Long Beach. From sea level, the platform would not be visible from shore. That point is about 70 kilometers, or 38 knots, from the ferry pier. Most ferries have a speed between 12 and 20 knots, so the boat ride will take between 2 and 3 hours just to get from the ferry pier to the launch platform. According to the New York City Department of Transportation, the Staten Island ferries, for example, 
have a service speed of 16 knots. Upon arrival, passengers will then have to make their way to the top side of the launch platform, which is a neat trick because they're not designed to be accessed from the water, where they'll go through security checks if they didn't do them shoreside. And they'll have to then queue up to get fitted for launch suits, helmets, and divers for the trip. Yes, we are going to assume that these people need every precaution given every other person that has been launched into space on a rocket. The full $180,000 flight suit, complete with airtight helmets, and the ability to crap themselves when the craft is pulling 3 Gs on liftoff. These suits are complex enough that not even the astronauts who went aboard the Crew Dragon were able to dress themselves. They were dressed and squared away by a clean crew, who also secured them in their capsule in their reclined positions. Shotwell said there were 100 people per flight planned. Musk has stated up to 1,000 per flight, but we don't think Musk understands what 1,000 people looks like. This is what 1,000 people looks like. So we'll stick with Shotwell's number, because even suiting up 100 people will be a process that takes hours. Let's lowball it and say they can do five at a time, and the process takes 10 minutes per guest. That's three hours to get 100 people suited up. Then they'll have to go up the launch tower elevator in groups to the only access port on the craft and get secured into their launch cradle in a five-point harness in a reclined position. After they are secured, guests will not be allowed to leave this seat until the craft lands at the destination. There will be no window seats, no snacks, no bathroom breaks, no medical attention available, no emergency abort system, no emergency landing system, just you strapped into this giant baby seat sealed inside an airtight suit with whatever smells you happen to make. Oh, and there's no barf bags either. Now that the guests have been shuttled, screened, suited up, and squared away, the airlock hatch is secured and they're all set to launch, right after they fuel up the rocket. That's right, this isn't an airplane where the airplane arrives at the gate fully fueled and ready to go. Standard SOP for rocket launches is that the vehicle is fueled just before takeoff, a process that for the shuttle took three hours to load up the 700 tons of propellant. The rates are similar for Dragon and Crew Dragon. The Starship by itself takes 1,200 tons, so that would take five hours to fill at the same rate per hour. Then the Super Heavy takes another 3,400 tons. So let's assume they're going to figure out a way to pump the fuel at twice the rate as current technology. That is still going to take 10 hours to fuel up the system after the launch facility has been completely evacuated. You're flying on a rocket from point A to point B. If you're on a plane and you needed to wait for an available runway at the destination or for weather to pass, the plane has the ability and fuel reserves to circle the outer markers until such time as runways become available. A rocket will be moving in a straight line and if conditions change at either the launch site or the landing site, they can't circle back, pick an alternate destination, or circle the landing area until conditions improve. So those guests will be situated in the cabin until such time as both sites are cleared for launch, hoping the flight doesn't get scrubbed, which of course some of them will. And when that happens, the guests will have to wait for the fuel to offload, get released from their cradles, get undressed, and get shipped back to shore to try again. But if both sites are clear and the vehicle launches, these guests will hear a deafening roar that they are hopefully insulated enough away from that they don't lose their hearing. And shortly afterwards, they will begin to feel themselves pressed into their cradle as if they weighed over 500 pounds due to increasing G-forces being applied to their bodies. The space shuttle astronauts experienced three Gs of force and Crew Dragon astronauts experienced four Gs during takeoff. These are similar forces to a carnival attraction called the reverse bungee which launches people into the air with 3 to 5 Gs acting on the riders. The ability to withstand G-forces varies by individual. Some will handle the forces without issue, some will get dizzy, some will black right out. And there is no shortage of video of people of all ages passing out cold due to being on these rides. Travelers will be experiencing all those same forces in reverse again when the ship has to flip around to land tail first using propulsive rocket fire. Unfortunately, people with underlying medical conditions who react poorly to these forces will not be able to receive medical attention until the craft has landed, is secured, and the patient can be evacuated through the airlock, down the elevator, and then taken ashore by boat or medevac flight. If all goes well, an hour later the rocket will land on the receiving pad, 
Once the rocket is secured, the remaining fuel offloaded and the hatch opened, the guests would disembark, strip out of their pressure suits, presumably have a shower if they soiled themselves through this process, and hop onto a ferry to take them to the closest marina, which is 40 kilometers from downtown Shanghai. So let's tally up all the time this has already taken. Two to three hours to ferry from Manhattan to the launch platform. Two to three hours getting suited up for the flight. Two to three hours getting secured in the craft, including the suit leak checks that are mandatory. Three to 10 hours fueling the vehicle. A minimum of one hour time in the air. Two to three hours debarking the vehicle and prepping for shuttle. Two to three hours to shuttle back into the marina and another hour to get transportation into Shanghai. Time elapsed ranges from 15 hours to over 27 hours. Meanwhile, and for a fraction of the cost, the person traveling first class nonstop slept in comfort in relative peace or watched movies in between catered meals with complimentary drink service and arrived in 15 hours to an airport 10 minutes from town. Even in business class on the A380, they should have had no complaints. And the odds of the person taking the plane dying on the flight was 1 in 11 million, where the odds of dying in the starship, considering there is no ability to abandon ship, would lie somewhere between 1 in 60 and 1 in 276, at best. In a two-deck, three-class seat distribution, this craft hauls 555 persons comfortably, without using flight suits or diapers. As you can see from this same chart, this craft is able to hold a maximum of 254 metric tons of fuel and can make it from New York to Shanghai nonstop. But the Starship would have used the better part of 4,600 tons of fuel for the same trip. 1,800% more fuel to deliver less than 20% of the number of guests. And they didn't shave a single minute off of the travel time. At the end of the animation, there is a fast rolling rundown of intended routes and travel times. So what we did is we went and freeze framed every departure destination combo to see how the cities on the list match the necessary criteria for being seaside with 32 kilometers of water between the launch pad and terra firma. Judging from this, they definitely did not do their homework. These port cities will fall into one of three categories. They are either clear to open ocean, they are an inland port, which requires a great deal of additional travel by boat to the launch facility, or they are completely landlocked. So let's go down the list. Hong Kong, inland port. Singapore, inland port. Los Angeles is clear. Toronto is an inland port on the Great Lakes, which don't have the width required for 32 kilometers of free space between the launch and the shore. Also, notice Pickering which is one of the largest power plants in the world with eight reactors and decades of spent material in close proximity. So this would never get regulatory approval. Bangkok is an inland port. Dubai is clear to the ocean. Tokyo is an inland port, would require hours of additional travel time, and the platform would be in two kilometers of water depth. London, completely landlocked. Paris, completely landlocked. Honolulu is clear, but again, you'd be dealing with 600 meters of depth. Delhi, completely landlocked. Melbourne, well that's an inland port, but it would require 100 kilometers travel by boat. Sydney is an inland port. Cape Town is clear. Buenos Aires is an inland port. Johannesburg, completely landlocked. San Francisco, an inland port. Adelaide, inland port requiring 155 kilometers by sea. Doha is clear. Auckland is an inland port. Athens is an inland port that might as well be landlocked. Zurich is landlocked. And Rio de Janeiro is an inland port. So final tally on these 25 ports, six of them are completely landlocked with no access to open water at all. 13 that are inland ports requiring additional travel by water to get 32 kilometers clear of all shorelines. And six cities that are actually clear to open ocean. Of course, seeing this, we decided to go one step further and check how many of the 50 busiest airports in the world would qualify to become spaceports, where the service city is directly seaside with 32 kilometers of open sea to a suitable launch platform location. Of the top 50, 29 are completely landlocked, nowhere near the open ocean. 10 are inland ports requiring hours of additional travel time by boat to get clear of the mainland and 11 are directly oceanfront, 
but four of them are in China. The only airport cities in the top 50 that have direct open ocean access in the U.S. would be LAX in the west at number 3 and Miami International in the east at number 45. And the only major European city on the list that is clear would be Barcelona. In the final analysis, traveling by rocket will not be quicker, it will not be more comfortable, it will not be more convenient, it will not fly to the cities Musk promised it would, but it will be far more expensive, incredibly wasteful, and extremely risky in comparison to regular air travel not only to the travelers, but also to any person or animal within earshot above or below the water, and it will cause incredible environmental damage, even if it does not crash or explode. Thank you for watching this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic and for continuing to support our channel. We have been enjoying the steady stream of feedback and questions from our viewers, and we encourage you to leave your informed comments, questions, and episode suggestions below. Give the video a like, share with your friends, and make sure you subscribe below to be notified when The Common Sense Skeptic returns.